I, Liam Khan, on behalf of Physics Society of St. Stephen's College, welcome you on day two of our annual Fofi Memorial Lecture Series. Now, without any further delay, we'll start our lecture. All the uh, entire audience is requested to switch off the phones so that any kind of hindrance is prevented. Come, please. Thanks. one is thinking about is the simulations. So this is just to, since this went by too fast, I want to tell you what are the uh, different uh, articles and so this I think is an article which was written the year, one year before I was born, which means many, many years before any of you. Anybody else was here was born. So this is, I personally think this is a very nice article. It's a book actually. Then there are essays by Eugene Wigner on aspects of science, which contains much, much more than what I have mentioned here. Then there is a nice book by Tony Z. I forgot to write his name. Fear of Symmetry, which is really a popular book. But nonetheless, it has many aspects of symmetry discussed in a nice fashion. Then Ian Stewart is a mathematician and he has written a book what he calls History of Symmetry. And again the focus is history and symmetry and beauty. And then the Professor Mukunda has written an article on the symmetries and that is in his book called Images of the <coughs> This was published by University Press, I forget which year, but it's very much there on ISC's uh, website where we have uploaded, also academic website where we have uploaded books and articles <coughs> by academic fellows and ISC's faculty. All right. Then, for those of you, this is for the teachers a bit, and also for students who are interested. There are these three, what are called resource letters which are brought out in the American Journal of Physics. And as I said yesterday, they are in three different years. As a result of that, they are looking at different aspects of symmetry. For example, this particular article really has come out five years after Wigner's Nobel Prize, which means it's really looking at rotational invariance. For the first time, symmetries and physics was sort of as big as it can get, so it is a very different thing. On the other hand, this one was about more about symmetries such as SU3 flavor symmetries, Gelman, particle classification, ideas which led to our understanding that proton is made up of two up quarks and one down quark, for example, which I'm sure somewhere in your, even in your modern physics, at the end of it, you see one small chapter or Wikipedia or whatever. And then, this is, as you can see, the years. And in 1988, this is gauge invariance. Because what I should tell you, which I will not have much further, I don't know how much I will cover tomorrow. But in particle physics, these three, namely the rotational, <coughs> translational invariance, special relativistic invariance, which I will discuss today a bit, plus the general coordinate invariance in the general coordinate transformations. This was the early 20th century. It came with a bank. Then the second part, then that actually helped develop ideas which later on went into, so these are space time symmetries. Then at the same time, electromagnetism and Maxwell's equations not only had the invariance under what we know to be the relativistic transformations, but they also had an additional invariance which we call gauge invariance, which I'm going to discuss only at the end of today's lecture. But this gauge principle is something that is at the end of the day the backbone of the entire world of particle physics, 
and these days a big part of the condensed matter theoretical condensed matter physics when people start talking in the two dimensional systems this whole ideas about bosonization and a whole lot which is essentially gauge theory in two dimensional systems so therefore and the last but not the least which i skipped in between was the beginner's idea of and the mathematical framework which was the rotation group that laid way through the mathematical descriptions and the and now i can use the technical word that the rotation group is the group of what is called so3 that is the three dimensional rotations of groups a group of transformations which leave the length of a vector unchanged okay i mean if you take three dimensional coordinates this will be discussed today suppose you take this and i change the coordinates i rotate it around the z axis what will happen to some angle theta my z axis will remain the same no because i'm rotating it and let's say so these these will then describe a rotation of the i hope people are not too unhappy if i use vector rotation so i define a point p by a vector r bar when r bar is this is nothing but the coordinates of this point x y z and then we know that <coughs> under rotation vector r bar we go to r prime bar so the same point will be described by another set of coordinates x prime y prime z <coughs> but the point is the same no that is space that is a point in space its description has changed and that change in the description is given to us by this transformation and these transformations will not change the length of this vector that is clear the point p is so distant from the origin is going to be fixed right so a vector will actually be also characterized by this the length of the vector the angle theta so this is point p this is the position vector this is theta this is phi that you have used this so therefore under this rotation the length of the vector remains unchanged and the rotation group then as this so called rotation group this is for people who know the words this is called s o3 and its covering group again this is only for those who know but those who don't know don't need to worry about it all i can say is that group theorists mathematicians have found certain similarities between the properties of this group and another group which is a group of 2 by 2 special unitary matrices that's a very simple for defining it's very simple i take a group of 2 by 2 matrices not very difficult consider all set of 2 by 2 matrices out of which pick up only those which are unitary you can figure out how to determine unitary matrices so you can parameterize your matrix as four elements a b c d four complex elements demand that it is unitary you will get relationship between a b c d they demand that its determinant is one and find the group of such transformation group of such matrices and they are that is called su2 and what is interesting is that there is something relationship very deep relationship between su3 and su2 which is called goes by this name and su3 its representations correspond to integral values of angular momenta this is what you need in your hydrogen 
atom spectrum, angular momentum, angular values. I am talking exactly of that same, okay? Though it appears through some different thinking, but that is not what we have the time to understand. Whereas SU2 can use can be used to describe states with half integrals. Spin half electron. What is its representation? What is the representation of SO3 which will give me transformation properties about how a spin half state will transform under the rotation of the coordinates? That is told to me by SU3. And spin half electron is bread and butter of calculating hydrogen atom spectrum. So this is the relationship which Wigner had figured out. And what I want to do, I don't think I have time, but what I would try to at least argue for you is that this particular group, I can then imagine extending it not to space and time, not to real space and time, but some imaginary uh, space. Because what does the SU2 do? It tells me how does a spin half the electron state transform under rotation. Okay. So yesterday I showed you those two pictures of Gaurav and his daughter. Similarly, under rotation of coordinates, a spin half state with spin projection say parallel to the z-axis with least choice of coordinates under rotation of coordinates will look like a mixture of state with spin projection plus half and spin projection minus half. Because those are the only two spin projections possible for a spin half particle. I think that is something everybody knows from atomic physics. So I start with a state which I will represent. This is just an abstract representation. A state with spin half, spin projection half under rotation of coordinates, it actually goes into some coefficients alpha i, alpha half plus beta. This is just a statement that an electron with spin in the positive z direction, spin projection half in the positive z direction in one coordinate choice, in some other choice of coordinates, will be some linear combination because some part of that state will have spin projection plus half, some part of that state will have spin projection minus. Supposing I go to a state a choice of coordinates where I completely flip, I rotate about y axis and I completely flip the z axis to minus z axis. Then what will happen? The state half half will just go into state half minus half. Alpha will be zero, beta will be plus one. Okay? So this idea, Wigner used and then we, many particle physicists used, one extended this idea to the case of neutrons and protons. And that is what led later on to quantum. So there is, I hope you see the different strands that I am talking about. There is this space time symmetry here, that is the picture. This we will discuss today in quite a bit detail. Space time symmetries are rotations, translations that we are talking about. It's one extension. <coughs> so this led, considerations of this led to, for example, things like SU2. This then led to what are called internal symmetries because this is one application that happens. The same space-time symmetries in one plus two, dim two plus one dimension, that means two space dimension and one time dimension. You can actually <coughs> have solids which you make which are only two dimensional systems and then you look at time evolution of states in such a system. You can apply the same formalism there, the same group structure there, except it will be specialized not to three dimensions. 
will be only specialized to two divisions. I'm just trying to show you the bigger picture, grand picture, how the same ideas are going to be used. So abstracting it from the specific case to the case of a group transformation, to later on finding the connection with this SU2 has helped me to take the ideas of symmetry from a domain where initially we understood them from experiments and now transported them to another domain. This is the beauty of symmetry. Here. And the other direction which I will not discuss at all is the general theory. So this is, if you like, the block diagram. Okay. And what we are going to do is just this only today. And ah, and one more thing <coughs> that an entirely different thing from here is <coughs> which is similar to this internal symmetry, except. These are going to be, this, all these words will make sense tomorrow. Here the transformations can be different from one point in space to another time in space. And here the transformations are the same at all points in space. See what's like, what it's equivalent to saying, I consider a rotation of coordinates. Now these are not, these are not real coordinates, these are coordinates in some imaginary space. And then I, if I allow the rotation parameter, that is theta, to depend on the space where I am, physical space where I am actually carrying out the rotation. That's a complicated story. And that's the story of gauge invariance, which we will need to discuss tomorrow. And I just want to set the stage for you today. So this same idea, it would be the same group, except that the gauge transformation parameters will depend on space. So you will mix, if you wish, the internal space and the real part of space. And I will show you that. And here, <coughs> these are global. So I will I have in the slides a little bit more, so I will at that time just, just point out to you. Transformation of the parameter is same at all points. Okay. As far as I am concerned, I put this in. For those who can gauge, come get something out of it, please get something out of it. For those who find it a bit lost, it's okay because I think some of these ideas I will try to once again <coughs> explain a little bit. All right. One question. Yes. In that, the formula written down below the boxes. Yeah. Is there any restriction on alpha and beta? Yeah, this uh, alpha square plus beta square should be one. Because the norm of the state should be minus. So the reason I was I was showing those two pictures yesterday was to say that it's only when I consider both states with spin projection plus half and state with spin projection minus half will there be real rotational invariance. Because coordinate rotation, if that's going to change the state plus half into a combination of plus half and minus half, if in nature I have realized only the plus half projection state, that would tell me that something very wrong is happening. This is just a way of understanding that under rotation it is this group that's remaining invariant. Okay, so that's what the point. But now, yesterday I had shown this plan of the lecture. At that time, I had not added this point there. After my discussions yesterday, I realized that maybe I want to spend some time and discuss symmetries of equation of motion more concretely. So yesterday, if you look at first slide, I only had said that I will talk about story of any author. I will reduce the part of story of any author, unfortunately. But I will still try to, if I finish get in time, I will talk about much about that, much as I wanted. First, I want to talk about symmetries of equations of motion. So let's see what I want. So yesterday what we learned was that if the system is unchanged by an operation, 
we call that operation symmetry of the system. Then we discuss mainly static symmetries of bodies. We said I rotated a cube, I reflected a cube, so on. And I discussed about shapes, bodies, designs. Only for the left-right symmetry, I went a little bit further and I told you something about laws of motion without really explaining. So, what did we discuss? We discussed the translation of origin of space and time through a fixed distance. I only talked about it. I said lattice has a translational symmetry. Then I talked of rotation of coordinates to a fixed number of angles or continuous rotations. And then I talked about reflection in a mirror. So, today I want to spend my time more on continuous symmetries because that's what Noether's <coughs> theorem is really all about. So, we should understand what this is. So I already mentioned to you yesterday that if I took symmetries of a square, this is not quite a square, okay, this is not square. So symmetries of the square, I can rotate an axis perpendicular to this, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. So those are just four rotations through some fixed angle. On the other hand, a circle I pointed out was symmetric under a continuous rotation. I could rotate it by 0.1 radian. I can rotate it by 360 degrees. And I can rotate it by many, many steps. And this is what is called a continuous symmetry. So starting from identity, which means no rotation at all, zero, I nine, can nine, always... Nine, nine, nine. Light off. Yeah, now you can switch it up. I think I will... Right now it's okay. I will come back. So, this transformation property can be continuously varied. What is the transformation property parameter in this case? The rotation angle. That's your transformation parameter. So, a transformation, either a translation through a finite distance A, can be thought about as a series of n infinitesimal transformations. You know, I change the origin by delta A, which is A by N. I change the origin again by delta A, which is A by N. Since all these operations form a group, N operations will give me a total translation to A. What is the advantage of it? The advantage of it, I can deal only with infinitesimal transformations. Mm -hmm. Result of a finite transformation, I can get continued by repeated application, and I need to worry about the complications. The algebra can just sometimes say it. And these are by technical, for those who might know the words, these kind of groups are called D groups. So, a rotation through a finite angle theta can be brought out as a series of n infinitesimal rotations through an angle delta theta, which is theta by n. And the group element, which is the, because I told you that the transformations themselves form a group. So, each group element is actually generated, and for an infinitesimal transformation, since an infinitesimal transformation is a small change from identity, I can always write it as 1 minus whatever are the number of parameters of my rotation times what is some quantity which is a group theoretic object which I call the generator of the transformation. Okay. In the case of here for example for my rotation group I would say r prime bar is some <coughs> 3 by 3 vector so r prime bar is a x prime y prime z prime x y z and this 3 by 3 matrix will depend on my rotation angle. We will actually derive it in half a minute. And this is, this can be written for an infinitesimal rotation as 1 minus delta theta. And depending on the three different axes of rotations, delta theta 1 corresponding to rotation about x axis, delta theta 2 corresponding to rotation about y axis, <coughs> delta theta 3 corresponding to rotation about z axis. And then Whatever is the 3 by 3 matrix that corresponds to x axis rotation, around x axis rotation, y axis rotation, I will call it th, ty, and tz. And group theory tells me how much of such, how many such generators I will have. We will not go into it. But mathematical framework of group theory tells me all that. I learn from my group theory all these things, which we are not going to do. But I only want to notice here that this is how one can write it. And then a final transformation will be simply an exponential of this, no? Because it is 1 minus summation i alpha i t to the power m. And I'm sure you all have learned limit n tending to infinity. This guy goes into exponential 
mind. So this is just the usual mathematics that we will do. Except that sometimes it gets extended to the case of matrices, which is fine. Okay. Now, now let me try to it, so we discuss static symmetries, but as I said, I want to now today discuss behavior of equation of motions are under reflection, under rotation, under uh, translation, and actually much, much more. So, now what has happened is that the physical laws, such as Newton's second law of motion, or Biot's law, or Ampere's circulation law, all these laws have been extracted out of a multitude of data, right? Experimentation. And the one that I am interested in are equations of motion. Okay? So equation of motion of charges, equation of motion of a particle under the action of a force, and these are all equations of motion which have been abstracted and you have figured out that starting from my initial conditions, it is the laws of motion which tell me what final state will the system attain. Alright. Now the thing to do is thing to do to see is that that the, the fact that we can do it at all means that these laws of physics do not depend on the space point in space or the point in time. If you do an experiment today, you get the same answer for gravitational constant. Uh, getting for, uh, using a pendulum that I got 45 years ago doing that same experiment in a completely different place. If that wasn't the case, we would never have found these laws of motion. So the existence of these laws of motion already tell me that not only that the space cannot distinguish between any specific point in time and position, that is basically the basic tenet of Newton's laws, but my laws also cannot distinguish between the two. And this is what I have said here, that the physical space, now the last, the physical space cannot distinguish between a particular point, does not have a preferred point in or place for the origin. You could write Newton's laws of force, um, motion starting with the origin at the center of the earth. You could start talking about it as a position origin here and nothing changes. However, that is not perhaps the case with physical laws for left and right. Space, again I told you, cannot set, distinguish between left and right naturally unless I give a direction. And since that direction is arbitrary, left and right has to be arbitrarily fixed. But actually, what I mentioned in my last lecture and which I will elaborate tomorrow, physics actually, particle physics, gives me a way of dis defining what is an absolute left and what is an absolute right. That's something quite beautiful and hopefully we will get to it. Alright. But now I hope I begin to tell, tell you that there is a difference between symmetries of space and time and symmetries of physical laws. I hope that distinction is somehow as a concept getting clearer. So, I'm going to look at how laws of physics change as I change the origin of space and time, or I change the coordinates. So can I have the light, please? So now let me discuss the first equation, or the only equation of motion that I will discuss in some detail. This, which I have been talking about again and again. I look at rectilinear motion. I don't really care. There is x is the coordinate. This is the line on which the particle is moving. Okay? It's a single motion, simple motion. Now, I ask myself a question. This is my particle is moving along the x-axis or if you like, it might have a wild motion, but I'm not looking at it. Okay? So, somebody else comes and says, I don't like this origin. I will use this as my origin. So, the axis x prime has its origin. What does that mean? That if I have a point which has 
determinants x and y. The same point is x prime and y. And how are x prime and x related? X prime, so this point, right? So x prime is x minus a. Very good. Now, what is fx? Is the component of the force along this direction. Now, just because I change the origin, the component of the force is not going to change. Whatever is direction the force is acting on, multiplied by cosine theta, you are going to get. So, supposing this is reflecting, this is my force vector. Fx is always the same, whether I am doing it with x prime or whether I am doing it with x. So, Fx prime is Fx. Everybody agrees with me on this? The force is making the angle same angle theta. Whether the origin is here or origin is here, doesn't matter. Angle is theta. And then if you want me to draw the vector, I will draw it like this. This is not the position vector I am drawing. I am drawing just the force vector. So, that again makes up angle theta. So, f x prime is equal to x. What is d2 x prime by d2 square? Look at this. Is d2 x by d2 square? Because this is a constant. So what do I find? m d2 x prime by d2 square. Assuming of course that my measurement of mass doesn't depend on whether I choose my origin here or origin here. Which of course would be absurd if that's what happened. So m is the same. So m d2 x prime by d2 square is m d2 x by d2 square. That's all what I find is that m d2 x prime by d2 square is fx prime. Does everybody agree with this? So what am I saying? I'm saying that the Newton's law of motion is the same whether I chose this as the origin or this as the origin. So you say translation of coordinates is a symmetry of this law of motion. Does everybody understand this concept now? So translation <laughs> This is different than saying that translation is a symmetry of space. This is adding to it the physics. If I do the physics here, choosing this as origin, if I do the physics here, I do it, do it still here, but I choose this as my origin, nothing is going to change. And that's what this equation is telling you. What, one more thing that you can already see, that Newton's first law tells me, tells us that m d2x by dt square, there is no force acting, this is 0, which tells me d by dx of m dx by dt is 0. d by dt. d by dt, yes, sorry. If fx is 0, d by dt of the dx by dt is 0, what does that tell me? This tells me momentum is conserved. So I have showed you two things, that <coughs> Translation is a symmetry of this equation. I have also told you that momentum is conserved. Alright? Symmetry, so this is what you see. I, for those of you who are, don't understand vectors, you can stop there listening to me. Everybody understands. Oh, I'm happy. I don't know. So, because first year I said that they understand vectors or not. I so I was trying to be very, very careful. Then I'm happy I don't need to do all this. I will go even faster. Thanks. <laughs> so therefore, what I really have is this here, that the m d2 r by dt squared is in bar. So this is the point that I want to do as the effect of rotations. So here I have done only translation. Now let me do the same thing for rotation. I can use this, my picture again, so I will not... Okay, before I do this, for how many people it's obvious that a vector is defined by its transformation properties? 
or vector is a quantity with direction and magnitude. Okay, very good. Then we will go on, then I will spend a little longer time. I got a little more ambitious after one. All right. But I want you to notice these two things. Huh? There is a conservation and then there is a invariance. And I have not yet related one to the other. These are just observations. Now, supposing I look at this, uh, actually, I want to, finally, I do want to use this because I will talk of two dimensions, x and y. And now I will change my angles, x prime and y prime. This is theta. And my point P here is x and y. Okay. okay. So let me ask how many people are comfortable with this. Otherwise, I will be right. I think if they are not comfortable, they can derive it. I hope everybody is comfortable. Now, th this was the 2 by 2 matrix, that 3 by 3 matrix that I was doing. And if I have a force acting on this, I also know. So, again, I'm, what I'm going to do? I'm going to look at this again. md2 f by dt squared is fx. So I'm looking at a transformation where x prime, x goes to x prime, y goes to y prime, and z goes to z prime. And z goes to z. My z is unchanged because I'm doing rotations around this. So md 2 x by dt squared is fx. Now question that you want to ask, what is md 2 x prime by dt squared? And you can again do exactly the same things that I was doing there. And you can prove. So now you can ask the question, what is fx prime? F, a component of the force vector f along the direction of x prime. It will be exactly like this, no? fx prime will be fx cosine theta plus f y prime will be f y percent <coughs> minus f x and f z prime is x. So what's the point of it all? The point of it all is now starting from this equation, starting from this equation, you can actually show is trivially valid and these two equations are given by these two equations because relationship between x prime and x and y is the same as relationship between fx prime and fx Actually, this is exactly the definition of a vector. A vector is a composition of three objects which transforms precisely like the coordinates. This has the advantage of extending the definition of quantities along with their transformation properties, this is really what Wigner did. Okay? All right. So this tells me that the laws of motion are actually invariant under a rotation of coordinates and it's, it's exemplified that both the sides transform as a vector on the So you dare not write an equation, a law of motion, where one side is a vector and the other side is the scalar. If you write on the right hand side a quantity which doesn't change with rotation, your equation does not have the right symmetry property. Your equation cannot be right. That's what comes out. Okay, so this is already a role that symmetries play in telling us to check our equation. Supposing, you know, these are not Newton's laws of motion. Supposing you are very smart and you are trying to figure out a new law how in two dimensional systems something moves. And if your law in the two dimensional case, the left hand side and right hand side have different transformation properties under rotation, you have made a mistake, you have to go back and look at the drawing board. 
because this rotational symmetry is of space that cannot be changed. All right? So symmetry of long motion is clear to everybody now? All right. And then you can go further and you can say that when I say that the equations are symmetric, are invariant under the action of rotation group and the group of translation. Now, I want to bring this one point here that yesterday we discussed that a circle was invariant under rotation. And Greeks actually made a mistake because they said therefore all the planet orbits should be circles. That's the only thing that is allowed by rotational invariance. But that is not at all what rotational invariance is saying. What rotational invariance is saying that if the observer rotates himself or herself through an angle theta and calculates all the things with respect to the new coordinate frame, he or she will get a result orbit which is inclined with respect to the original orbit, but that doesn't matter because the relationship of sun and the earth and the relationship of the sun and the earth here are exactly the same. So, an observer which decides straight, strangely enough to keep on head tilted will not find any new law. We will find the same law, we will find the same results and that's what is the rotational invariance of the system that we are talking about. And that's why I can have an elliptical orbit and still have a rotational invariance. Okay? That means that the system by itself, now we are realizing that this system, the description of this system as a whole, it's invariant under the operation of rotations, but that doesn't mean that the orbit is rotationally invariant. The orbit can change. That means the transformation property of a particular instance, a particular system, can be non-trivial under rotation. That need not be invariant under rotation. Like a spin up electron with a spin up projection plus half will not remain spin projection plus half when I do the rotation of the coordinates, but it will go into some linear combination and then I'm happy. Okay? So, is this clear to everybody? There is an invariance and there is a trans non trivial transformation, and both will reflect the properties of uh, uh, symmetry. All right. So another one along with the equation of motion, historically we also knew about conservation of various kinematical quantities. For example, if there is no external torque acting on the system, you knew that angular momentum is also. And a standard example which we learn in unit 12 is if a person is gyrating around and wants to guide it faster and faster, tries to reduce, make himself or herself small so that the moment of inertia is decreased. And angular momentum is simply the moment of inertia times the angular frequency, and that's the way we understand. Linear momentum is conserved, I just now told you. In the absence of a force, linear momentum is conserved. In the absence of a torque, angular momentum is conserved. The total energy of system is also conserved. That is, the system is moving. It can, the system is moving. There is a change in the system's position, and one of the examples is pendulum that in the different positions, the total energy of the pendulum is the same, but the energy transforms between potential energy and kinetic energy. Somebody asked me a question yesterday, I don't remember who, afterwards. So all these symmetries are just ideas in people's minds, but the point is that we calculate the relationship between the length of the pendulum and its lifetime, its oscillation frequency using these ideas, and we find they are correct. So obviously these are not just Flights of fancy, these are real symmetries. Okay? So, this is the simple example. But at that time, this I am talking before 1900, these were just observations. People knew them to be correct, but people, you know, physicists always like to know why. You know, why is it so? Why is linear momentum conserved? Why is angular momentum conserved in the absence of the torque? Why is energy conserved? Because the system is moving, the system could do many different things. And if it is not dissipative, nothing changes. So what exactly happens? What is the reason? And this reason became actually, the reason these things become important is I'm sure you all have heard of this particular thing in beta decay, that in beta decay, the electron that comes out, comes with all kinds of energies. So initially it really puzzled people. 
that there is an the energy difference between these two nuclear <coughs> levels. A certain energy is available. An electron comes out. The electron should have all the energy. <coughs> and the electron simply doesn't have all the energy because you find electron in all kinds of energies. And the end point is actually exactly the energy difference between these two energy levels. So which means some electrons manage to be, you know, grab all the energy. They are selfish enough. But only very few electrons. Most of the other electrons are poor things. They get less energy. So exactly how does this happen? This was quite a bit of a problem at the level that Bohr, somebody like Bohr, had said, maybe energy is not conserved in nature at all. Why? Because they didn't know that there is a deep and fundamental reason for energy to be conserved. So the question you want to ask is that if someday, in some measurement, you find that linear momentum is not conserved, energy is not conserved, should you be perturbed? Is the world going to stand upside down? If I understand why, then I will know the answer to this question. And that is exactly what I mean of what did. I wanted to, maybe at the end of the lecture I will come back to the real derivation. Right now I will continue with my discussion. So what Amy Norther did is that she proved in 1918 that for every continuous symmetry, it has to be a continuous symmetry for a theorem, there is always a conserved quantity. I have written here derive on board, but I am running short on time, so I won't derive it. Those who are interested in the afternoon, I can show you the derivation separately. And what she saw, showed is that because equation is invariant <laughs> under space translation, whenever an equation of motion is invariant under translation in space, linear momentum will always be considered. So she was the first genius actually showed us why. That linear momentum is found to be conserved because the world of physics, the world of natural laws is invariant under space transitions. Now this, I hope you appreciate what kind of big advance this is. It's one thing to know that Newton's equations of motion satisfy space uh, translational uh, symmetry. And it's another thing to know that that symmetry is responsible for conservation of linear momentum. Because tomorrow, you can, for some other law, you can see a conservation and then you can say, aha, I can write the force law because I know that this conservation must correspond to some symmetry of that force law. Once you have understood the one-way path, you can go backwards. And that's why the whole idea can then push forward the knowledge boundaries. And it is this transformation that I want to convey to you. And that is why I hope you appreciate what an important step this was by the work done by Amy Noether. In fact, one can show that rotational symmetry corresponds to angular momentum calculation. So if you know that a force law is rotationally symmetric, which means if you know that the force between two particles is a function of R alone and not of the direction, and if you start getting results where angular momentum is not conserved, you have to step back and say, maybe I forgot a factor of half somewhere. This is a, because there is a deep fundamental significance to this. And that significance is what physicists want to understand. That is the difference between a mathematician and a physicist. A mathematician is quite happy, Amy also was a mathematician. She was quite happy showing that there exists a conserved quantity. But now a physicist wants to apply it. And he wants to see, he or she, whether my equation is right. My equation has a chance of being right if it at least satisfies this symmetry. That doesn't still mean that it will be the right description. I will still have to check other things to make sure that that's the right uh, description. Does everybody understand this point? Because this is one point that I want to get across. Yes? What about the conservation of charge? Ah, you ask me. I'm going to come to that because I have not talked about the corresponding transformation. Give me a few minutes, that's going to come. Okay? If not today, it will come tomorrow. Because conservation of charge is one is invariant because of the transformation on some unseen coordinates. Today I'm talking of space-time symmetry. Space-time symmetry is the space-time translations. I will come to charge. Give me, be a little patient with me. Okay? So now you see that. <coughs> Translation in space gives me linear momentum, rotational symmetry gives me angular momentum, and translation in time 
gives me conservation of energy. So this is, the, this is basically the implication of the fact that laws of motion, Newton's, Newton's basic <coughs> hypothesis, that there is no unique position and prime for the origin. Okay, that's really the statement that we are making. Okay? And I use the word generator, if you remember. So the, how many generators are there? Mathematics tells me. That mathematics tells me how many quantities that will be conserved. So once I see the symmetry, I can tell you how many conserved charges I must have in a system. So it's it's really ready and it's really pretty. I hope there will be ready. Actually, her theorem also removed an apparent contradiction in general relativity. In fact, she was invited by Hilbert. I don't know how many people know Hilbert's name. He was also a very famous mathematical physicist. <laughs> and there were these famous Hilbert's problems, which actually drove the progress of in mathematics for a long time. So Hilbert and Einstein were collaborating. Hilbert also wrote the, uh, it's called Hilbert-Einstein action. So he also made very fundamental contributions to writing the theory of gravitation, which is symmetric under general coordinate transformations. And both Einstein and Hilbert were sort of confused because in the early days they found that the general theory of relativity showed an apparent violation of energy. And Hilbert was completely upset with it and they actually called Emil Lothar to Göttingen, saying that maybe you have, her PhD thesis was on invariances, said maybe you can help us understand this. And she helped them understand it by deriving from this theorem. And what she did was showing that what they were looking at as a conserved quantity was not the right conserved quantity because in case of general theory of relativity, the curvature has a back reaction. Space itself gives contribution to energy momentum tensor. And that is something they had, though they knew and they are the ones who introduced it, they had forgotten in doing the energy conservation, they had forgotten to take into account this back reaction. And in her formulation, it just gave. And that gave them the answer why energy is indeed conserved. In fact, Pauli used the energy at the angular momentum conservation to postulate a new particle, namely the neutron. Now I'm shifting from general theory of relativity to a new phenomenon called beta decay, which I told you had this problem. There was an apparent energy non-conservation. And as I said, even Bohr was ready to throw in the towel and say energy is not conserved. And at which point, out of desperation, Pauli actually postulated that maybe it's not two particles, a third particle is produced and it carries away some energy. That is why energy is not conserved. To us, because that guy is neutral, you cannot detect it in your detectors. Now we are much smarter. Our experimental colleagues can even detect things that don't leave tracks, but that's a story to be told by an experimental physicist, not by me. So, all right. So, actually, there were three reasons. He wanted to preserve conservation of energy at angular momentum, which means rotational invariance and time translation invariance. But he also wanted to preserve the exclusion principle that he had derived. What is Pauli's exclusion principle? It says that a state has some specific transformation property when you exchange the two parts. That's what I told you yesterday, the exchange of the feeder and the feeding. Exchange of two electrons, we have discussed this. And in this case it was exchange of two neutrons or two protons. And if that had to be preserved, to do all these three things, to explain the observed spin parity, to explain conservation of energy, so all these things are symmetries. In a time transmission symmetric, rotational symmetric, and exchange symmetry. <coughs> so now I have brought a third symmetry which I didn't tell you till now, exchange symmetry. You exchange one type of particle by another type of particle. So what is the two electrons? One electron will spin up, other electron will spin down, I exchange. How system will behave if there are two identical particles? That's a different story. Many of you might have read the name of Bose Einstein condensate. So there is a big story here, which again is not for us to discuss right now, but needless to say that you can appreciate that symmetry principles have something to do. <laughs> So the risk, this is what I call, and I use the word from Professor Mukunda's notes, it's a restrictive role of symmetry. Okay, it, symmetry restricts what can happen. And actually, this is one example of symmetry 
predicting a particle. Tomorrow I will give you a few more examples of symmetric predicting. But again, this tells me I'm not just looking at new laws, I'm looking at new particles. And from what? From simply based that space is, there is no special point in space, there is no special orientation of coordinate axis, things which look trivial, self evident. And those are leading us to such profound results. Then there is something now that everybody knows a little bit about Lorentz transformations, so I can just uh, talk about it. Uh, let me go through these few slides and then I will stop. The Lorentz derived, which I hope everybody knows, that the electric and magnetic field should transform in a certain fashion when frames are moving with respect to each other so that Maxwell's equations are right. Now what are Maxwell's equations? That I will write. Because again I think it's one of the big, I would say big achievement of experiments done by Faraday and extremely beautiful thinking by Maxwell that these are the four equations. A dot B equal to zero. A dot E is Fallon not L cross E. This is Faraday and Maxwell law. So this is Ampere circuit law. I always get it wrong. I think these questions everybody is comfortable with. Now these are, as I said, each one of them were known by some other thing. This was Gauss's law, one of them was Ampere's law, one of them was Faraday and Maxwell's law. This displacement current was something that Maxwell added. Now it took firstly Faraday's imagination to introduce fields. Because he didn't like the idea of how can you have action at a distance. So that's why we started with this, that maybe you know, electron sits here, there is something here, and another charge sitting here, and it sees the force because there are these field lines and force lines, all kinds of things, okay? Now, Maxwell looked at these See, he was the one who made them complete. Now, there is something very interesting that you must note about it, that you can manipulate these equations, and this I want to use. I can manipulate these equations, and I can show that this is, they satisfy this equation, the wave equation for electromagnetic propagating fields. And there, C square is the product of permeability and dielectric constant of medium. It's free phase, in the free space. Oh, one hour, yes, okay. I am. Rushing too fast. Yes. I'm happy that you people are catching my mistakes. Typhoons. But the important point that I want to make, my mind was, is that these are the properties of the medium. Now, that means that Maxwell's equations tell me immediately that velocity of light C must be the same in all frames of references. Because it's the property of the medium in which the wave is propagating, which is vacuum. How can that change just because the observer decided to start moving? Which means that the velocity of Maxwell's equation tell me that velocity of light C is the same in all frames of reference. Do you appreciate this? I make a measurement in the train, I measure mu naught and epsilon naught. I make a measurement here, I measure with mu naught and epsilon naught. I have to get the same answer. So now this is where you see that Maxwell's equations are inconsistent with Galilean invariance. And the, the beauty of Poincaré and Einstein separately was in realizing that therefore the transformation under which Maxwell's equations are invariant are not Galilean transformations but Lorentz transformations. Lorentz had derived these transformations by saying that electric and magnetic field fields must transform like the Lorentz, like the transformations which he had given, so that this equation is valid in all frames. And this equation had to be valid in all frames because this was dependent only on the properties of the medium. Okay? So therefore, Einstein 
used, if you wish, Lorentz transformations, and now postulated that the way space and time transform when you look at a system between two coordinate frames which are moving with respect to each other is different than what we thought in the Galilean transformation. Because what was the Galilean transformation? That if you had one coordinate frame like this, and you had another coordinate frame which was moving with a velocity, sorry, velocity v, then along the x-axis, let's say, then the Galilean transformation told you that the coordinate of point P would be x prime equal to x minus v. That was the Galilean transformation. If I had applied that, this would be wrong. So Maxwell's equation as they stood were inconsistent with Galilean transformations. And they were consistent if I allowed the space and time to be related by Lorentz transformation. So now here you see that Lorentz transformation is a symmetry of Maxwell's equations. Okay? So you have figured out that these equations which were obtained by a mass of data which were essentially describing motion of electromagnetic particles under action of particles which have electromagnetic charge under the action of electric and magnetic fields, these equations are invariant relativistically by themselves. And they actually have led Einstein to realize that the equations are really what they are because there is a there is a symmetry under the act of motion of frames and therefore now apart from translation of origin translation invariance rotational invariance relativistic invariance becomes my third demand on a law of motion that means again and of course the good part is relativistic invariant transformations reduce to Galilean transformations when the velocities are small. So all is very good in the world of physics. We have found a new symmetry of law of nature, namely relativistic. So tomorrow, and that's what happened when people started writing down theories of strong interaction, theory of weak interactions. Wait, you have to make sure that your theories are relativistically invariant if you are talking of fundamental particles. If you are talking of a solid, when the velocities are small, you don't care about that. But if you are talking of particles which can potentially move with the velocity of light, you need to worry about it. So this is what I call a descriptive rule of symmetry. An observed fact has been understood in terms of an underlying symmetry. Do people see that? That Maxwell's equation have relativistic invariance built into them because the genius of people who wrote those equations did what nature needs to be like. And now we understand that this, this Maxwell's equations are what they are because physics needs to be relativistically invariant. So the relativistic invariance of electromagnetic interaction is what has given the form to the Maxwell's equations that now I come to your point, just mention your point, I will discuss it uh, tomorrow. So there is one more thing which I hope, I am sure everybody knows, but I will write it nonetheless because it is important for me, is the following. If I do, you know, what actually people have noticed long time back, that because of these equations, we know that I can introduce a vector potential and a scalar potential and you can find a series of vector and scalar potentials all of which will correspond to the same electric and magnetic fields because and that Force law is Q E bar plus B by B by C B cross. So I can have a whole series of 
electromagnetic and the terrestrial scalar potentials, all of which will for us give me the same force. There's no thing by C. Of course there is. Oh no, there is one by C. There is C. There is one by C. You are using two different sets of units. I, I, I will tell you what's really happening because I am so used to using H cross equal to C equal to 1. I I am trying to so put them. SI units, there's no C. No, no, sir. I am just trying to put them in as I go along. So that's my mistake. I mean, if, if you ask me, my equation will be just like this. My equation will be just this. But uh, I was trying to be more careful. I tried to put the H crosses and C back. And I put them wrongly back. So therefore, what we have now is B bar equal to del cross A and E bar equal to, I hope I have the signs right. They're both negative. Huh? Yeah. Yep, they're both negative. Yeah. So, now you see that if I change phi and A bar by phi by D phi, some DF by DT, and A bar by del F, the equations will remain the same. So that's the symmetry of the equation. That's what you were asking. Associated with this symmetry is the law of charge conservation. And this is what we will talk tomorrow. So this is the symmetry of the equation of motion. This is, in classical electrodynamics, you can see it like this. In a quantum theory, it's slightly different. I don't think I'll have time to tell you that much. I'm only going to talk about gauge. So here we see that A bar going to, please now excuse me if I have some signs wrong or some factors wrong when I'm trying to rush. <coughs> you will find that the equations will remain unchanged, where F is an arbitrary function. And then you will find the equation that the F must satisfy as a result. All that requires a choice of gauge. And, uh, so I don't want to now go into the details. But I want to show you this, that it is this transformation. And there is a multitude of these fields. Because F is a continuous function. So I have a whole family of A bars and phi. All of which will correspond to exactly the same E bar and and once they correspond to the same E bar and D bar, that is they, all of them satisfy this equation, and the force depends only on E bar and D bar. So I have something called uh, invariance of this system of equations, which is very huge. And this is naturally there, because I have derived, I can derive it from this. So Maxwell's equations have within themselves gauge invariance and invariance to So that is where we will begin, and yes sir. Does the breaking of any symmetry affect any other symmetry? Yes, there is, and that is the hope of discussing it tomorrow. Doesn't the symmetry give me a natural equation? Yes. Such as the existence of nice symmetry? Yeah, but if you see, it's like this. Symmetry tells me that magnetic monopoles can exist, but they need not exist. That is what I was trying to explain to you when I was going through this orbits. That symmetry means that I can have this, this, these are how should I, rotational symmetry. Let me take the example of rotational symmetry. <coughs> Just because I have rotational symmetry doesn't mean that all the objects are spin zero. I have systems with down at down trivial angular momentum. I have systems with zeros. But if someday now we know that there's a spin zero particle that is the least particle. But if it didn't exist, that didn't mean that rotational invariance was wrong. Am I, am I making sense to you? That what you really want to see is that what is allowed by a symmetry. Symmetry does not tell me that if there is an electric charge, there must be a magnetic charge. That is not the kind of relationship we get. Okay? That it requires a little more discussion, but at the same time, this tells me that in principle, magnetic monopoles could exist. Now we have to ask the question, is it a necessary thing? Will some symmetry go haywire if they didn't exist? Will the symmetry of these equations be invalid if magnetic monopoles didn't exist? And that's 
because this simply says that the charge is zero. Product, there is some relationship between the charges, okay. products of the two charges. That can be zero and nobody can do that. That's an arbitrary number. Am I making sense? Okay. Do you want to answer questions now or later? I can answer today because today I have, I'm okay. I mean, this is a good point for me to stop now. And uh, I am ready to take questions. If people want, if people don't want, that's also okay by now. I just wanted you to point out one thing. Yes. You mentioned the uh, infinite effort transformation in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned when you spoke about Lorentz and uh, Galilean transformations that the low velocity limit of Lorentz transformations is the Galilean. Correct. But the infinitesimal Lorentz transformation is not the Galilean transformation. No, 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 no. So in case somebody, I happen to mention this in my class. Ah, no, surely, you can't get right. It. Because actually, what I had mentioned there, which now I don't have time, I was going to actually talk about my current group, and I was going to show how everything that I have here is subsumed in my group. And that would have actually naturally made the point. Because Lawrence boosts have a very different character than others. But thanks for making that. I was just worried that some of our students might try to get the Lorentz transformations from the Galilean transformations. No. <laughs> Lorentz transformations are a different beast. Now, because I had sort of, I think I decided not to do So, people want to ask questions now, that's okay. People are you going to be available in the afternoon? But I will be available. In the afternoon? I'll be in the common room. And if anybody really wants to know a little bit more about uh, in the Northwest theorem, how it is moved. Actually, I spent quite some time to try to prove it in this classical uh, context because normally this is proved in a quantum context. So I, I was sort of looking forward to presenting it. So why don't we schedule it? I mean, maybe at 2:30 you can. I'm happy to talk about it if people want to come. Yeah. So those of you who want to come can come back. Yeah. yeah. Because I spent if some the time. Is, if the classroom was available, then just check if the classroom is available. I mean, I'll be happy to explain it because I did spend some time in trying so whoever to... Whoever is interested can come. Everybody doesn't have to come. But nobody has to come also. <laughs> some people better turn I am, I am completely... I won't take it up. Let me put it up.